Hi, ho, hello, and welcome back to the Utujua Hujui podcast. Unfortunately, we are going to be doing audio, or should, is it really unfortunate? Unfortunate for whom? I guess for people that wanted to see my beautiful face. <laughs> But I suppose, like, unfortunately, we'll be resuming the audio format of this podcast mainly because I've started to, I'm back at university, so, like, I need to do a lot of work, which means I don't really have the time to sit and edit video because it's a lot more work than editing audio. And also, it means that I can record at, like, 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning in my pajamas and, like, not have to get dolled up for y'all. So, we're back. Hi, I'm so sorry that we've been distant. Um, It wasn't you. It was definitely me. (laughs) I moved countries and now I am chilling with the colonizers. (laughs) I mean, like, that doesn't narrow it down, to be honest, because, like, if we're talking about France or Germany or China or Russia or America or Canada or Australia or New Zealand, damn, world history is fucked up. No, but of course I'm... Oh, and and the Spanish. But no, 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 of course I'm referring to England, the original colonizers. And I completely forgot I could have also been talking about South Africans because they also colonized Namibia for a while. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Anyway, I'm back. Hi. Um, And to be honest, everything is going great. I'm in a lovely place called um, Exeter. And so far, so good. Everything is wonderful. The city is beautiful, if not a little hilly. The people are lovely or welcoming. Um, And the food is you know, food. Um, Also, just a a slight note about the accent. I have been here for like three weeks, which means I've really had a chance to get reacquainted with the whiteness that is my accent. (laughs) So it's not going to be like, I'm hoping it it doesn't sound too different to what you're used to. Um, But hearing back the recording as well, it just sounds very... Wow. Okay, not just scare. Like you just left, and okay, all of a sudden, an accent <laughs> sour. <laughs> Even that was sounded like so bougie. But you know what? I've said this once, said this million times. My entire aesthetic is bougie. Um, and to be honest, I'm I'm good. Um, now, if the reason why I mention where I am is because I need to talk about a particular statue that is in my new home. Um, it's a statue of a guy called Revere's Bueller or Redvers Bueller. I'm just going to go with Revere's because that's how I saw his name being pronounced somewhere else. And he is a Victorian era soldier of empire who quote unquote saved Natal. What from? Who knows? The plaque really doesn't say on the statue, and we'll get to why this is a problem later. Um, But it does commend him from saving his men in battle against all odds. And as a bit of a spoiler, the statue was erected on 6th September 1905, admits criticism from military personnel and politicians for the work that he did in the Second Boer War. Work which may or may not have been associated with the establishment of concentration camps, which is like not a thing the British invented, but they did pioneer it and just spread it across their empire to great effect. Just ask Kenyans, we still remember this shit, even if the British themselves refused to acknowledge it and were forced to by a court. (laughs) Um, And again, like, hold on to this information because it's a special fact that's going to come back later. Uh At the time, the statue was erected to, quote, remind future generations of Western men of the brilliant services performed by Devonshire's most illustrious son of this period and cannot fail to inspire them with a desire to serve our sovereign in their turn as well and as faithfully as Sir Revere's Bueller has done throughout his long and brilliant career, end quote. Put simply, the statue was not just a statue to a man, but also a statue to service in and for the British Empire. And that context cannot be removed from how we interpret and how we choose to talk about the statue. Now, my first reaction to seeing it was like, oh, 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 oh. this man must have done some fucked up things because, you know, no one, ev- no one good ever really gets a statue. I think we learned that lesson from like, the BLM protest in 2020 and we all kind of just sat there and were like wow like y'all really spent millions of dollars and millions of pounds commemorating a flawed version of history that privileged the histories of the of the winners over and above the histories of the people you damned over and over and over again and continue to do so and then when we bring it up you're like how dare you want to reframe history how dare you want to 
change the past. It's like, no, we're not changing the past. History is not a story that is static. History is constantly in flux as we learn more information. If your history makes you feel good about yourself, I think you're doing it wrong because the purpose of history should be to make you feel uncomfortable. Literally every time I read history, I feel uncomfortable. And it's not just because like I happen to be a Kenyan and most of world history is like, white people constantly shitting on black people and then black people constantly shitting on ourselves (laughs) in return um as well as white people and people of power just constantly shitting on the on the powerless like it's just this fucked up thing and it constantly makes me feel uncomfortable because it's supposed to challenge you and frustrate you into some sort of action and reflection so that you don't repeat this history so that history doesn't rhyme but but I like the second I read the 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 commendation on the plaque, um, and this idea that like he was you know he saved Natal. It also has all the places where he served, which was like Sudan, Egypt, Ghana, South Africa, China, India. You're like, wow, this man really did like the greatest hits of the British Empire, which means he probably didn't do some fun things. He was probably out there doing things that most people today would consider war crimes. And some people even back then were like, yo, this is, um, this might be a problem. This might be something we want to stop. Um, so imagine my surprise when I learned that I was right. (laughs) Um, Bueller's statue is therefore divisive on several reasons. Quoting from contested histories, quote, First, for his involvement in 19th century colonialist expansionism, including the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879 and the South African War from 1899 to 1902, aka the First and Second Boer Wars. And second, his alleged connection to the concentration camps in South Africa during the South African War, which resulted in the deaths of thousands, end quote. So before we begin to talk about what he did and didn't do, we need to talk about the politics of memory for a smidge. And like, I know I'm just like teasing this history, but I do think it's important we remember or rather we we couch this conversation in a much larger discussion about like, what does it mean to remember a past? And what are we saying by how we choose to remember that past? Because Our answers to both of those questions say a lot about our values as a society. It says a lot about who we are and who we wish to be. So the fact that a soldier of empire, a man of the landed gentry, was immortalized in his lifetime is not a surprise to me. It aligns with the values of the time, values that venerated empire and believed uncritically in the might and rightness of that empire. But what does it mean to defend this statue in the 21st century. After the British Empire has died as a political entity, somewhat, um, what does it say about your society, um, that about this community that I am now a part of, that when the Exeter City Council proposed relocating the statue out of respect to the concerns raised by people of color, that the statue represented an unhealthy attachment to an imagined and biased history, one that privileged and acknowledged the stories of the colonizers while ignoring the truths of the colonized. People went to bat for this statue. No sooner had the Exeter City Council proposed to relocate, not destroy, not take down, just to simply take this and move it somewhere else, had a petition been filed on change.org condemning that proposal. And here's what some people had to say. Now, excuse me, allow me to take from one of my favorite YouTubers, her name is Swoop, and just Petty University is in session. One lovely gentleman said that, and I quote, we cannot stand by and let historically illiterate people erase our history, all the while ignorant of the historical illiteracy he just displayed. Uh, Right here, I fucked up. I meant to say the petition itself says we cannot stand by and let historically illiterate blah, 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 blah. My bad. Correcting it in post. Sorry. While another said... They signed on because, and I quote, I am tired of all this anti-white, anti-British political correct rubbish. The statue has been there all these years. So why should it be removed just because of the thugs? If you bow them to this country, this country is going to go down the holes. And I just have to say, this is a lot to deal with in the statement. And like, it needs to be broken down bit by bit. So first, anti-white what? Respectfully, this entire society was built for white people. It's very difficult for you to be anti-white and it actually means something in terms of governmental policy, number one. 
Number two, British cult politically correct rubbish, I'm sorry, is me telling you that you are, like your empire was potentially fascist and definitely a shithole to live in. Politically correct or is it just a truth you're not ready to hear, a truth you're not willing to hear? And third, yes, because acknowledging and attempting to reconcile your history is what is going to doom Britain and not the fact that your government is selling out your public services to the private sector. Yes, history shall be your downfall, which I mean, in a way, isn't wrong considering that like your own misunderstanding of your own history is what led y'all to vote to leave the EU. But hey, yo, what do I know? I'm just one of those foreigners you want to kick out. Um... But also, like, are you saying that just like, are you also arguing that just because something has been there forever, it deserves to continue being there till the end of time? Because by that same logic, like the monarchy should also still be a thing, uh, as well as like racism. <laughs> it actually reminds me, it actually reminds me of one of my favorite jokes from The Good Place. System. Torture works. It's the way it's always been done with all due respect. It's the way it's always been done is an excuse that's been used for hundreds of years to justify racism, misogyny. Exactly. See, this chick gets it. Now, moving on to somebody who displayed a little more nuance in their historical illiteracy. And they said, and I quote, Although Beulis is generally regarded as an incompetent general, I object to a load of ignorant thugs dictating their views on British society. And surprisingly, yes, I do agree with you. A bunch of ignorant thugs are dictating and imposing their views on British society. Rishi Sunak, Sula Braverman, fuck them both. Um, but the colour of those thugs may very well surprise you, hun. They're not exactly who you're imagining as you use the word thug. <laughs> okay, while well, someone else drew upon their personal experiences to the connection to the city, saying, and I quote, I grew up and lived in Exeter for 50 years. This statue is part of the history of our country. We have all grown and changed our outlook on life for the better. However, it is still our own history. Full stop. All lives matter. And I was like, good God, you were so close. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. And you know what? All lives do matter. But like, and to also paraphrase Orwell, clearly history has shown us, even Bueller's own history has shown us that some lives matter more than others. That is policy. That is history. That is politics. That is economics. That is law. I am sorry if you disagree with the truth and I'll wait for you to do, to do your own learning of, of history and then come back to me after you've been educated. Um, and finally, we have this comment and I quote, I am fed up of people trying to rewrite history by removing statues of our glorious dead. Soon, there will be none of our visual history left. Stop bowing to the minorities and leave our statues intact, end quote. Okay, but sweetheart, and, and, and hear me out here. Why is it that we and people like me are not able to celebrate and venerate our glorious dead. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about why it is that the British Museum has so much culture in it? How was it acquired? Where did it come from? <laughs> are you, it's just, I, I just, mm. okay. The only way I'm gonna get through this episode is if I breathe deeply and I breathe consistently, but and you might also, like, to this person, allow me to say, you might also want to ask yourself why visual history is so important and why it might mean, or rather what it might mean for someone like me, a citizen of a former British colony, to walk by a statue that venerates a man that animated the very actions that dispossessed, brutalized, and in general fucked with my family, my community, my country. Is that suffering not important too? Do we also, is, is, it, is, it to, is it rewriting history to acknowledge that suffering and put it on the same pedestal with which you have elevated your own warped version of history? Or, or is it only important that you feel hurt and triggered and that therefore we must bow to you? I'm going to let you think on that for a minute. So naturally, because of course it did, this petition to stop the Exodus City Council from relocating the statue succeeded. And that's how I found it exactly where it was um, erected nearly a hundred and almost 20 years later. Um, but the city council said that they would, quote, 
retain and explain. They said that they would put up a plaque contextualizing Beulah's role in the British Empire and why some people, most people really, ought to take offense to the veneration of his legacy. Except they never did. So <laughs> allow me to do my thing. Um, now, let me say, I went into this research and like into writing this episode hoping for the worst. But what I found wasn't actually that bad. Oh, like it's bad. But by former colonizer standards, it's average, which still means he doesn't deserve a statue. So crackly crack. Let me open my drink. <sighs> Let's do this. To begin with, I would like to start with Brian Best's description of Bueller simply because nobody can be petty like an academic. He starts his account of Bueller's military history by saying, and I quote, when satirists lampoon a typical overfed, red-faced, block-headed Victorian general, they probably have in mind a picture of General Sir Revere's Bueller. In his 60s and reluctantly in command of British forces at the outbreak of the Anglo-Boer War, he indeed cut an archaic and risable figure. He was ponderous in both speech and build, and his rather piggy eyes were set in a crimson, jowly face dominated by a large, grey, walrus moustache. And I wish I could say he was lying, but he was not. For people who are like are listening to this audio, I just, I'm going to give you a minute to just Google what this man looks like, because if people who are watching this video, I will put a picture up of him right now so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, Because, yeah. Um, So now, Revere's Beulah was born in 1839 to a West County squire and MP. Now, a squire for the uninitiated is basically a man who owns a lot of land, uh, potentially the most amount of land in his area. And Beulah's father owned 5,000 acres. Now, let me put that into context, because that is a lot of land. And I think that we've just been broken by, like, the fact that billionaires exist, that we don't appreciate how much something is worth anymore. Um, So... The Vatican, the Vatican City itself, is roughly like 110-ish acres, 109, 110 acres. Um, And that means the Bueller's family owned about 45 Vatican City's worth of land that generated 14,000 pounds in income in the 1830s to like 1880s. Roughly 465,000 pounds per year in 2023 money. Now, again, our brains have been broken by the fact that billionaires exist. So I'm pretty sure you're thinking, well, that's just not that much money. Like, I feel like five, like half, like making half a million pounds a year is like middle income now, <laughs> middle class, which good God is fucking bleak. Um, but let me remind you that it was half, um, it was the equivalent of half a million pounds in the 19th century, a time when the average person earned less than a hundred pounds per year. Sometimes people were getting paid as low as £10 per year, and Beulah's family owned land that brought in an income of £14,000 per year, which means that they were basically millionaires of the time. Um, he was, or rather Beulah, was the second of seven sons and four daughters, which props to his mother because uh, 11 kids is not a check my vagina could and is willing to ever cash. Um, And because his father was quite wealthy, he grew up on a lovely country or the country, there we go, country estate. But because he wasn't a lord or a duke or an earl, basically higher nobility, he often engaged with the estate workers or people who actually worked the land in order to make his family rich. From them, he learned carpentry, smithy work, animal husbandry, and other rural skills that would prove useful in his campaigns. At the age of five, he attended school and went to Harrow and then Eton. His childhood was actually pretty idyllic um, until 1855, where at the age of 16, his mother died in his arms right before Christmas, which Jesus Christ. So like what happened, what happened was, um, while they were waiting for a train, his mother collapsed of a lung hemorrhage, probably from TB. But again, I'm not a doctor. I am just a random person on the internet. Um, so she managed to, after collapsing at the train station, she managed to last three more days before she, again, to reiterate, died in his arms. And to be honest, 
when I read that the first time, <laughs> I genuinely thought that his mother had been <laughs> had tripped and fallen into the path of an oncoming train and learned what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object, aka squish. Um, but this is so much worse. To like watch your own mother die, to tend to her, to watch her slowly decline and know that there is absolutely nothing you can do about it is a trauma I would not wish upon anyone. Um, it really makes you feel for baby Bueller's. Even though he's going to go on to do some empire shit, it makes you, and probably inflicts the same amount of trauma to other people. It's still, he, like, this is sad. Um, and things got worse when six months later, his favorite sister also died. And then some time after that, another sister and his brother also died. Thankfully, they did not die in front of him because life is all about small mercies, I suppose. Um, in 1858, Bueller's then goes on to join the military. I think he was about 19 years old, if I have my math correct, which is, uh, yeah, like that's a lot, you know, um, by, and he bought a commission with the 60th, 60th rifles, um, one of the elite British regiments. So back in the day, you'd have to, you'd be able to pay somebody for promotions in the army. Now you'd imagine that this was like quite problematic because people who hadn't done it, people who hadn't done a damn thing were being promoted above the rank and file soldiers who were like did their time, who'd built expertise, who had built a sense of camaraderie with their troops. Um, people who probably deserved it more than the guys who were buying their way in. Um, and you'd be right. But this system also allowed some truly brilliant minds to bypass the glad handling and kiss assing involved in military promotion and just get straight to the top. A really good example of this is the Duke of Wellington, who purchased his promotion and then went on to defeat Napoleon had the Duke, and no, I don't mean Hastings, um, gone on to the, you know, the whole traditional route of like being promoted through the military, through expertise and, and just skill acquisition, I doubt he would have been in the position that he was um, that would have allowed him to defeat Napoleon. And I believe the same could be said of Bueller. Bueller served in the 60th Rifles, which was a military regiment whose history of service includes the French and Indian War, the American War of Independence, the Napoleonic Wars, the Anglo-Egyptian Wars, the Second Boer Wars, and the First and Second World Wars. Unfortunately, before he could even begin his service, Bueller badly hacked his leg with an axe. The injury was so severe that the doctor recommended amputation. But bu <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'll explain why I'm laughing in a bit. But Bueller essentially said, fuck no. And in my mind, the image that just ha that just conjured was like Bueller like trying to like hobble away as fast as possible <laughs> as a doctor is like chasing him down with a rusty, bloody axe that he has not cleaned in years. <laughs> Ooh, the fuck the past is so gross um but thankfully Bueller was right and he survived he survived not having his leg amputated he survived almost chopping it off with an axe and it healed but the injury gave him a limp for the rest of his life after recovery Bueller was posted to India and then Hong Kong it was in Hong Kong that he took part in the second opium war you know the war the British instigated to force the Chinese government to legalize opium, which is a drug, and uh, the trade of it, aka still an addictive drug, for the benefit of them and their empire, even as the Chinese government had restricted the sale and use of opium in order to deal with an opiate crisis. Because the British Empire just does not give a fuck if it means that uh, I get to make money as the British Empire. Now, thankfully... Bueller's was enough of a human being to recognize that like this was fucked up and he refused to wear the medal he was awarded for serving in that war. It's unclear if he participated in the looting of Chinese artifacts and cultural heritage because of course, of course the British did that shit. When have they never not been to a place and said, oh, I'm going to take this, I'm going to take this. Is that, are you, are you not, of course you're not using it. I killed you, I'm going to take this because it's the British fucking empire. Like the British museum is literally stuff the British stole and there is an incredible podcast by that same name please go check it out i love it so much um but bueller did walk away with a little something something from the war because a horse kicked him in the mouth <laughs> sorry a horse kicked him in the mouth and this left him with a speech impediment which affected the way that he spoke for the rest of his life as you would imagine after a horse kicks you in the mouth because dear 
God, even my jaw is like, no, nothing about that seems like it would be remotely enjoyable. Potentially funny to watch, but remotely enjoyable. Um, at this time, Bueller resembled more a reluctant soldier of empire. Contemporaries of the time described him as, and I quote, a raw and self-willed young man with perhaps no great interest in his profession. Which then begs the question, why join the military? More importantly, why would you, or rather, why would Bueller stay in the military? And that's because he was a second son. He was not set to inherit a dime. So if he wanted to make his fortune and his way in the world, if he wanted to leave a mark on this world, he needed to do something else, hence the military. And I suppose it's a good thing he did stay for British history, maybe, because after Hong Kong, Bueller was sent to Canada. In Canada, his potential was recognized by his commanding officer, Colonel R.B. Hawley and Colonel Grant Wolseley. The latter awarded him a leadership position in the Red River Expedition of 1870, where he corralled and organized the men. Now, this expedition was a response to the Matisse, an indigenous people of Canada or uh, indigenous peoples of Canada who, um, who had called for self-determination and rejected the further expansion of British colonialism in Canada. In this expedition, Bueller successfully kept his, man, his men together and alive as they traveled across 515 miles of vast Canadian wilderness. Let me put this into perspective for you. Now, an average human being takes like what, uh, like, a, like an hour to walk three-ish miles. Um, and this means that if we like do the math, and hopefully my math is mathing, that these guys walked for 68 days. This is assuming they did not rest. They were just walking every single hour of every single day. And they probably did rest as well. So if you factor in rest, it's entirely possible this entire journey through the Canadian wilderness um, in what I would like to assume might have been like Canadian winter melting into spring. So it was fucking cold. And Bueller kept everyone alive for months which is impressive because you know the british kind of historically have needed native support and native allies in order to survive their new environments that they sought to colonize um, which is just a wonderful way to say thank you to the people that helped you survive we're now going to take your shit thank you so much for keeping us alive um which is like very impressive um all things like notwithstanding um and as he walked, as he marched, he was, of course, suppressing indigenous rights along the way. He did so well that his boss, Wolseley, later said that Beulah was, as, and I quote, full of resource and personality and personally ab absolutely fearless. Those serving under him always trusted him fully, end quote. For just how good he was at suppressing the rights of indigenous people, um, a town in Canada is named after him. It's called Revere's in, in Saskatchewan in Canada. And I had like a quick Google of the town. Um, it's pretty. Like it literally is like what you would think of when you think of small Americana. Like mom and pop shops, wide roads, lots of open land. Um, everyone like this real small town community feel where like everyone knows your name and everyone is always in everyone's business, which is both a blessing and a curse. Um, shout out to Mombasa. Um, but anyway, recognizing his success, Bueller was invited on another expedition, this time in West Africa, where he would serve as an intelligence officer in the Ashanti War. Here, he was asked to scout the advance of the Ashanti capital, Kumasi. At the time, the British government was attempting to consolidate the various settler colonies that made up the Gold Coast. Naturally, the indigenous people of Ghana were like, the fuck you will. And so in early 1873, the Ashanti king, Kofi Karikari, ordered his army to attack the British at Elmina and in an attempt to reclaim the port. Now, Bueller was tasked with scouting the route the route that the king would be taking and stopping him along the way. And here is where he did what we would consider to be war crimes. Beulah ordered his men to burn villages to the ground to deny the oncoming Ashanti forces food, refuge, community, and shelter. He and the British justified his actions as, quoting from the University of Exeter, an attempt to end Ashanti practices of slavery, but used enslaved women among the 17,000 porters employed to carry its own equipment, which 
of course, of fucking course. How many times have even in this podcast, how many times have we seen the British Empire coming in to say, hey, we're coming here to stop slavery? And then they just do a slavery with extra steps. It is fucking baffling the extent to which the British Empire will, will, will basically eat its own tail and say one thing, but then do the exact same thing that they were condemning as bad. Because, of course, because why the fuck not? Um, now, the consequence of you know, burning down villages was that he basically also caused a starvation epidemic among the Ashanti people. And he subjected thousands of children to the same fate that he himself befell, which was to watch their parents die. And he did the same for those parents as well, as some of the Ashanti parents had to watch some of their children die because they didn't have food or water or shelter. Now, an international humanitarian law The use of starvation on civilians is prohibited and considered to be a war crime. However, lest people accuse me of judging Bueller by modern standards and not the standards of his time, allow me to note the following. Starvation has always been condemned by people around and throughout history. While leaders may recognize its usefulness as a military tactic, they also recognize that it is fucked up, which is why they work so hard to write this, to square this circle. Because they often say, oh, if only they had submitted or, well, they let themselves starve. They, who told them to fight us? If, if they're just given up this land that we want. And it's like, well, would you give up your land if people were coming and invading it? Clearly you didn't. Because that's what the Battle of Britain was about. That's what Boudicca is about. So again, I must ask, what does it mean to have Bueller's statue, a statue that commemorates and therein venerates his service in Ghana? What does it mean to have that statue just exist in a, in a place that is as somewhat diverse as Exeter? Is it a tacit acceptance and veneration of this legacy? Like, like, what are you trying to say? That it was okay that he did these things? That it was ultimately justified because it was done in service of empire? And that the empire is good? Is, is, is that what you're saying? Um, anyway, as a result of these practices and, I suppose, superior British military technology, the Ashanti lost. And as penance, the king was ordered to pay 50,000 ounces of gold. 1,000 of which was to be paid immediately and the rest whenever the British wanted. Now, for reference, 50,000 ounces of gold is worth close to 74 million pounds, if I'm not mistaken, which is a fuck ton of money. And the British also forcibly opened trade routes and put an end to slavery, even though they themselves used slavery to power future expeditions to the interior of Ghana and would then institute a system of colonialism that consistently oppressed black labor and ensured that they would never fully you know be paid for the work that they did in enriching the british empire after the capture of the ashanti capital the british plundered it and this time bueller was in charge of the plunder once again quoting from the university of exeter and i quote This role, outlined in his commanding officer's soldier's pocketbook for field service, involves advising on whether plundered items should be auctioned among soldiers on the spot or sent home to be auctioned on behalf of the participating troops. The official hall had included King Coffey's state umbrella and a golden stool, which Wolseley gave to Queen Victoria and which are still in the royal collection. Much of the plant plundered Ashanti gold is now in the British Museum, Wallace Collection, the Royal Artillery, Artillery Mess at Woolwich, the National Army Museum, and the Green Jackets Regimental Museum, end quote. So yeah, I just find it like very interesting that the British decried Africans, Indians, and Native peoples of America, of Australia, and Canada as savages, and then went on to steal our shit. Like, if we were truly inferior... Why do you want our stuff? It would be like Regina, uh, Regina George in Mean Girls, after saying, that is the ugliest effing skirt I've ever seen in my life, then went to steal that skirt from her after murdering her entire family. I just don't understand the delusion, but as we've learned in 2023, being the Lulu is the only Solulu. Um, but I often also wonder, like, is it just like the nature of power and conquest that you must denigrate a culture before ransacking it for items, artifacts, and knowledge that benefit you, that you can neither agree 
nor accept that these people whom you are killing and destroying have something to contribute to the world. Because if you did, then you would have to maybe recognize that perhaps you're doing a bad thing. You might have to have one of those, are we, are, are we the baddies kind of moment. Anyway, so after Beulah did some imperial shit in Ghana, he went, or rather returned, to Britain. In Britain, he assumed a desk post with the British military, where he would stay for three years. In that time, his brother, the heir to their father's vast fortune, unfortunately passed away, leaving Beulah to inherit the 5,000-acre, 14,000-pound income-generating inheritance. And to be honest, Beulah was like, actually, I am good now. I have done so well. I've done so well for my empire. Um, and people really think highly of me. I think I should just quit while I'm ahead. In fact, here are what some of his men, or here are some quotes about what some of his men thought of him. One trooper said, and I quote, if we were lying in the rain, so was Bueller. If we were hungry, so was he. All of the hardships he shared equally with his men. Never did Bueller, as commander, have a patrol tent to sleep under whilst his men were in the open. He was the idol of us all, end quote. Another lieutenant said, and I quote, it would be impossible to exaggerate what he accomplished with Beulah's horse, a curious conglomeration of humanity, of varied nationalities, of every class of society, not excluding the criminal. But by his marvellous personality, that unstable, volatile body consolidated itself into an effective and dependable force, which lost all efficiency if the leader was removed. I shall never forget how we all looked up to him and admired him, end quote. And I think this praise is what defenders of his statues choose to focus on because it's true. Like he seems to have been a very respected, at least until the Boer War, he seems to have been a very respected, very highly regarded military official. Um, and unfortunately, what a lot of these people who are relying upon these quotations and these accounts of, 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 of his service forget is that he, like it's not all praise because not everyone is like good all the time we are flawed human beings and apparently Beulah was incredibly insecure as one of his commanders Wolseley noted and I quote Sir Herbert Stewart is much better than the two all round though Beulah has some excellent military qualities Beulah never loses a chance of crabbing Stewart's ability and making out that he is constantly wrong end quote but simply, he was trying to pull some Regina George shit. And yet, everyone chooses to focus solely on the praise he received, without realizing that, again, they are privileging one story, and that history is complicated and incredibly messy. And so are human beings. Like, it's incredibly possible for somebody to be beloved by his soldiers, as well as a petty-ass bitch, um, as well as a harbinger of doom and misfortune by the people whom he disempowered by acting as an agent of the British Empire. And that's because, once again, human beings are complex, we are multifaceted, we are neither just good or bad, we are just human beings. Um, and that is a direct quote from academics, which I am working my way towards becoming. One day I shall be quoting myself. <laughs> anyway, but it's the work he did in South Africa that has most people feeling a little uncomfortable because of the war he fought in and that is the second boer war which is and was infamous for britain's establishment of concentration camps quoting from the national archives and i quote concentration camps were established by the british in south africa for boer families who had been expelled from areas being swept clear of boer commanders or guerrillas by british troops as well as by Africans who had been displaced by the war. In both black and white camps, many died from disease due in part to the insanitary conditions and overcrowding. The liberal politician Sir Henry, Henry Campbell Bannerman openly condemned what he called methods of barbarism, end quote. And the British would keep doing this all over the empire, once again, just as Kenyans, um, so the good news for the Bueller lovers out there was that he was not involved in this particular war crime. Um, the concentration camps were established in the early 20th century and British and, Bu I'm sorry, and Bueller was already back in England by then. The 
bad news is that the war exposed Bueller's fundamental cowardice and insecurities, undoing the good reputation he worked so hard to cultivate. So we need to backtrack a little bit and talk about the first time he was in South Africa, which was the war of like 1879, the First Boer War. And that's where he won his Victoria Cross for saving his men from Zulu soldiers. Although the petty ass bitch in me feels the need to mention that this incredible act of bravery was only instigated and necessitated by Britain's imperial appetite and was therefore completely unnecessary if they knew to leave well enough alone. But still, <laughs> I suppose he did a brave thing by like saving his men from, from, from the Zulu soldiers and uh, allow me to quote from Michael Barthorpe, who explains what happened. And I quote, Much gallantry was shown in the rescuing of the wounded, and Bueller himself was everywhere, spurring his men on, saving others who were cut off, and not leaving the plateau until all were clear. On reaching the plain, so many horses had been lost that only by men riding pillion on the remaining animals was it possible to get clear and ride for Kampala. Bueller had no sooner ridden into the camp after dark that he was told that the few remnants of Barton's forces were lost eight miles away. Despite the exertions and strains of the last 36 hours, he immediately rode out to look for them. And admittedly, even I must begrudgingly say that this is the kind of thing that is worthy of public recognition, this ability and this willingness to sacrifice yourself um, in order to save other people is definitely something that we should commemorate and ought to commemorate in, 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 in our culture and in our communities and our societies. But once again, it cannot and must not be removed from the context of British imperialism and the fact that they were fighting against people determined to maintain their independence from colonizers. It would be like somebody saving a puppy from a fire that they started, especially because of... Uh, <clears throat> What happened next? Quoting from the University of Exeter, and I quote, The following day at the Battle of Kambula, Bueller led a mounted infantry charge to kill as many Zulu as possible when they broke off the attack and ran from the concentrated British fire. A Captain Darcy wrote that Bueller and his men butchered the brutes all over the place, while Bueller himself was like a tiger drunk with blood. It's uh, cute, I suppose, that the people who want to remember his commendable bravery forget what he did next. It's convenient, is it not? Um, after the battle, Bueller and his troops combed the battlefield for any survivors and killed anyone who was left alive. Around 1,200 Zulu soldiers. Speaking of the consequences of this battle, Professor Nandini Chatterjee of the University of Exeter writes, and I quote, Not only were tens of thousands of African people killed in Carvanon, Fair, and the Bru and Beulah's wars of the South African Confederation, but viable, independent societies were broken apart and families separated as the template for apartheid was laid. After the fragmentation of their kingdoms, Kosa and Zulu men were obliged to engage in migrant labor, working at low wages for white employers in South Africa's towns and cities. Their mobility laws policed by past laws, while women were left to scrape a subsistence for themselves and children in environmentally degraded reserves. During the ensuing decades, and especially after the South African War, this system was refined by the British investors in South Africa's industrialization and British governments. It was inherited and turned to specifically Africana purposes in the guise of apartheid after the 1948 election of the National Party. Which is to say that history has consequences. You cannot choose to venerate a single part of it without looking at the whole, looking at how this one thing that he did, this one thing that occurred in history, big begot all these, all the rest. Um, and after his stint in South Africa, Bueller's returned to England and got hitched. 
Um, and then he went on to do more colonizer shit in Sudan and Ireland. And Ireland is particularly interesting to talk about because rather than siding with the empire as he had done in India, in South Africa, um, and in Ghana, um, he sided with, the, and in Canada, he sided with the Irish peasantry over the English landlord. He understood their plight, saying, and I quote, There is not much law in this part of the country, but a short time ago, what law there was was on the side of the rich. Nobody did anything for the tenants until the league, the thing, the group that was fighting for Irish peasant rights, was established. Adding on, he would write, and I quote, The real evil in this country, Ireland, is want of money. Unfortunately, this compassionate attitude would not be shared with the other melanated subjects of empire. And of course, I am talking about the native South Africans, the native people of Ghana, and the native people of uh, Canada. Yes, uh, unfortunately, the empire needed him once more. But this would be his last stint that uh, would tarnish, ultimately, his reputation. So South Africa, so he went to, he returned to South Africa around in, in 1899 after he'd been made a general in 1896 and after gold had been discovered in the new South African Federation. Immediately upon the discovery of precious minerals like gold and diamonds, the British, like Veruca Salt and Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, said, Daddy, I want that land. And off Daddy Empire went to secure that land. Unfortunately, this is where I will have to leave you because I simply did not have the time to finish researching the episode. And the more I read about Natal and what happened there, the more I wanted to give it my full attention rather than rush through it for the sake of just producing an episode. But with the information I've provided here, I think we need to ask a very simple question. It's a question I, that began this episode. What does Bueller's statue represent? What does it mean that people in the 21st century continue to believe the story that that statue represents and the story that was ultimately weaved by the British Empire, one of simple glory and brilliance, one without the messiness of history, one unbridled by the legacies of colonialism, one that actually benefited immensely from colonialism. It is worth noting that 32% of Britons believe the empire is something to be proud of as of 2020. And this is the second highest in Europe. 33% believe that former colonies were better off when they were part of the British Empire. And that was the highest percentage among those surveyed. And 27% of Britons, more than a quarter of them, would still like to have an empire. Unsurprisingly, those who voted to leave the EU, conservatives, um, were more likely to believe in the glory of the empire and that countries like mine were better off under British control. And again, I feel like I must say for the people in the back that British, the being under British control means subjecting innocent people to mass policing and surveillance, to concentration camps, to dispossession, to disempowerment, to a lack of fundamental freedoms and an opportunity. And I wonder if all these feelings are bolstered by statues that peddle an uncritical, sanitized version of history that ignores the pain and suffering of the people Bueller's went to suppress on behalf of empire. I mean... (laughs) Fuck wondering. I know that's exactly what's happening here. I know that this is what happens when people are misinformed about their own history. So if we want to change, if we want to do something, we have some work to do. And retaining and explaining that statue isn't going to fix the fundamental misunderstanding of British history. We need to go back to our schools, back to our curriculums, back to our presumptions in the way in which we talk about empire and colonialism and power and politics and and history and development and aid and really just start having earnest conversations about what it means to have been colonized and what it means to have been the colonizer and where we go from here. Thank you so much for listening and uh, I'll see you again at some point (laughs) if I have the time to write another episode. 
Bye. Oh, that was oddly cheerful. Oh. Hi, I'm back. There was an update. Uh, so apparently, um, initially, the government had basically put a pause on all retain and explain policies instituted by different counties and basically said, now, hang on a minute. Let the central government do its thing. Um, and four days ago, yeah, four days ago, um, the government published its guidance to protect historic statues, which is un be fucking leaveable. And here is what the guidance says. And I quote, Removing heritage assets risks limiting our understanding of the difficult parts of our history mm -hmm. and of actions people took in the past, even if they might not be considered acceptable today. The starting point for guidance is for custodians to comply with the government policy to retain and explain and keep assets in situ, but to complement them as necessary with comprehensive explanation. And by the way, explanation is in quotations, which provides the whole story of the person or event depicted. So a fuller understanding of historic context can be known, understood and debated. End quote. And I just find this particularly hilarious because number one, why is explanation in, in quotes? Like, <laughs> it's an explanation. It's not an explanation. It's an explanation. Number one. Number two, do you want to know what else risks limiting your understanding of the difficult parts of your history? Not talking about it and basically spoon feeding your entire country and generations of your entire country a fucked up version of history that continues to praise the British Empire. The legs to which this government or, you know, to be honest, any government will go to to avoid apologizing for its actions, for its past actions is quite truly incredible can you imagine if you had a friend like this a friend who hurt you and then when you came asking for an apology when you came asking for like them to recognize that they have caused you harm said well see i'm afraid that if i do anything to recognize that harm i might just be like overwriting our history and i don't think that's good so like here's what we're gonna do i'm going to explain my actions away but like that really isn't gonna change what i've done so enjoy <laughs> oh my god i can't i genuinely can't believe this so the guidance, or rather the, cult the culture secretary, Lucy Fraser, goes on to say, and I quote, History is nuanced and complex. It is full of grey areas, which is what makes it so interesting. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are times when statues and monuments depict people or events that we, that we very much disapprove of today. <laughs> At the same time, the UK has a proud history as an engine for progress, democracy and liberal values. How is this engine catalyzed respectfully? How did you go about spreading these values to your various colonies that you colonized under the guise of spreading civilization? Please explain this shit to me. Sorry, she, Lucy, of course, did not say this shit. I'm the one speaking for Lucy because Lucy, of course, is never going to say this shit. And, I, and she goes on to say that, and I quote, That is why I want our cultural institutions to resist being driven by any politics or agenda and to use their assets to educate and inform rather than seek to erase the parts of our history that we are uncomfortable with which is exactly what you have been doing i find it really funny that this policy has been framed as apolitical when it is in, when it is not apolitical it is very much bandying a very specific type of politics one that seeks to never have to apologize for the crimes of the british empire let alone even recognize them or teach them to their children because doing so would undermine the very might and the very basis upon which this empire was built it would undermine the very structure very foundations of this country and of course we cannot have that can we oh anyway so this guidance is only valuable and only valid for statues which they call quote-unquote commemorative heritage assets and by the way it says a lot that like you think that statues depicting the glory of an empire that harmed killed brutalized and traumatized millions of people for about 200 years is part of your heritage and therefore speaks about a fundamental nature of your character find that incredible but the guidance does not extend to museums and gallery collections which just means that all the shit that's in the british museum that was stolen is going to continue <laughs> not being contextualized as such which of course are fucking course but it also doesn't um, include any items that do not form part of the statue itself it does not include any form it does not include any intangible forms of heritage such as dialects and dance and does not include any heritage assets that are outside england this guidance to me is quite funny 
again once again if you really like there are consequences for not doing this job properly and we are seeing those consequences in shit like brexit and shit like suella braverman confidently speaking out of her ass as she says that multiculturalism has been the worst thing for this country as if she is not part of that multiculturalism my god the racial delusion in that woman this entire government is just clearly they are proving delulu is the only solulu take a deep breath take a deep breath it's fine like everything is not fine but you know what it's fine (laughs) anyway tldr you can read this guidance yourself i've posted a link in the episode description i just wanted to add this on to complete the story as well as to make this episode as relevant as possible because i don't want to have to come back to this i genuinely do not have enough energy to be this petty because why i was petty anyway bye have a beautiful time for real though what the fuck is a British government (laughs) thank you so much for listening to the Utajuo Hujui podcast I really appreciate you giving me your time of day I know that your time is very valuable if you'd like to connect with me you can find me on Instagram at utajuahujui.pod that is at U-T-A-J-U-A h-u-j-u-i dot p-o-d on instagram please don't forget to like share review do all the nice things i could really use the boost okay enjoy the rest of your time on this planet goodbye